Any other well, questions? Not seeing any, none are coming up in the chat. So again, Dan, thank you as always. It's always informative uh, to hear from you. And uh, it makes me go back and uh, and have to read a couple of things to make sure I haven't done anything or hit any of the high points that uh, you've warned me about because I feel like I've been warned now. So thank you very much. All right, thanks. Looking forward to seeing everyone in person again. Thanks. And next, I'd like to introduce Paul from Exchange Docs. Uh, he Exchange Docs is an online uh, exactly what it sounds like document exchange where you can uh, use it to collaborate with uh, other members clients and uh, using it as a portal so with that i'll turn it over to paul maybe i won't be turning it over to paul um katie are we early i'm i'm all i'm all oh, good there <clears throat> we are I I was clicking unmute like a fiend and it was completely ignoring me. So thank you, <laughs> thank, thank you kindly. Um, those remarks from Dan, by the way, thanks for introducing me. It's Paul Engels of Exchange Docs. Exchange Docs is, is a Corbitech organization. Uh, Dan's last comment <laughs> in a bad way really got me excited. Wire fraud through compromised email uh, is, is, is most often problematic when it's actually the highly valuable and privileged attachments to the emails that are appropriated by the malicious parties to uh, to undertake their fraudulent activity. What a great segue to uh, uh, to Exchange Docs. Exchange Docs is a private, secure document exchange portal ex specifically designed for lawyers and law firms. As mentioned, comes from Corbitech. It allows you to safely and privately exchange legal documents and files of any size. You and your staff can easily track the status of every document, who opened it, when, was it downloaded, yes or no. And most importantly, all of those attachments are encrypted. So even if in the unfortunate event, your email is compromised, uh, the, the documents are of no use to the outside parties. If you happen to be a user of, of ACL as well, you can use Exchange Docs to electronically serve parties under the current rules of Ontario Rules of Civil, Civil Litigation. Uh, upcoming, there will be two, uh, this is next week, two exclusive FOLA Exchange Docs webinars uh, to orient you and or your staff and teach you a little bit more about the subject matter area. FOLA will email the information. Uh, we've got staggered sessions, uh, the 24th at 11, the 25th at 4. You're welcome to attend or your staff, either or both. Do keep in mind that for FOLA members only, we have a 60-day no-obligation trial of Exchange Docs to give you some experience with it. If you'd like to see the invitation to the webinar sooner, by all means, go to corbitech.ca, scroll right down to the bottom, and under events, you can register for the webinar so your staff can right away. And thank you very kindly for the opportunity to say hello and, and greet the members. Um, do have a great panel following. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul. So with that, I'm going to introduce Peter O'Keefe and Chris Johns. Uh, Peter is the director of the project implementation implementation branch uh, at MAG, and Chris Johns is currently directing the criminal justice transformation team, which uh, I am watching like a hawk uh, in my uh, in my world. So uh, very excited to have them uh, come and tell us about some of the innovation we hope to see out of our uh, our provincial government partners. Great, thanks so much for the intro. Just give me one sec, I'll share my screen. Make sure everyone can see. Can everyone see this? Looks good. We got it. Perfect. All right, thanks for the intro uh, and good morning. So uh, yeah, today, like what I'd say, I think Chris and I are both uh, excited to be here and uh, spend a bit of time with you to talk about some of the work that's happening um, uh, across the ministry. So my name is Peter O'Keefe. Uh, I'm the, the director of the project implementation branch within the Ministry of the Attorney General. Uh, I, I think I'm the new guy here. I think many of you know Chris, but uh, I'll pass it over to Chris and maybe you can just do a quick intro for yourself, Chris. Sure thing. Good morning, everybody. I am uh, Chris Johns. If you've seen me speak before, you know me as Chris, the modernization guy from MAG. I am now Chris, the modernization guy from the Ministry of the Solicitor General, focused exclusively on criminal. So uh, when I get to talk, I'll be talking to you about criminal stuff. Uh, and I'll flip it back to Peter to take us through his work. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. 
Uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about some of the modernization work that's happening across both uh, both Meg and Solgen. Uh, I'll start off. So we have a bit of an agenda. So I'll start off talking. We just picked out kind of a few things to talk about today. So I'll start talking about some of the work we're doing with virtual and hybrid hearings, uh, justice services online, uh, case lines, and then the newly announced. Hopefully, people have seen that announcement uh, on the court's digital transformation initiative. Uh, and then Chris will take the second half, uh, and then he'll provide a bit of a uh, update on the Criminal Justice Digital Design Initiative, uh, and then some work on the Digital Disclosure and Hearing Hub. So first up, uh, virtual hybrid hearings. So I think many of you are aware in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had, we had to adjust quickly uh, to the way hearings were held. Uh, and we introduced new tools, uh, new technology over the past year and a half uh, to support different ways of, of running, running hearings. Uh, and I think many of you will probably have seen the Justice Accelerated Strategy. So that was something that the government announced, announced back in March. Um, and this the piece I'd add here, like this is really about shifting away from emergency response into long-term, more sustainable uh, efforts to support modernization. So the Virtual Hybrid Hearings Initiative uh, is one of the initiatives under that strategy. Uh, and this is really aimed at expanding and improving uh, a courtroom's capability uh, for holding uh, a remote or a hybrid hearing. So this is a five-year initiative. Uh, it's already underway. Um, specifically what we're looking at, you can see we have a design A, B, uh, and C. But what, what these really are is uh, getting equipment in the courtroom. So the first one, uh, and obviously the most affordable one, is the audio only. <laughs> uh, and that is kind of like the most basic or minimum uh, requirements you need to run a, a, a hybrid hearing. Uh, the second one is the audio video. And this provides a good experience uh, uh, to, to have both video and audio uh, within, within a, a hearing. So you can have people in the courtroom and people uh, remote. And then Design C, uh, I would say that's our Cadillac version. Uh, that's audio video, but also includes uh, the dedicated uh, JVN, so Justice Video Network, uh, and purpose-built hardware. Uh, so obviously, as you get further along, they get more expensive. <laughs> um, but this is, so the thing I'd say here, like this is really about uh, equipping uh, courtrooms, and it is a five-year uh, initiative. The other thing I'd add is we're also looking at, um, you know, those who may have difficulty navigating a uh, hybrid hearing, we're looking at other things we can do uh, to support. Uh, so the one I'd call out is the remote and simultaneous language interpretation, uh, so we can do live translation. So that's something else uh, that, that uh, we're working on. So like I said, five-year plan, uh, we're working with uh, uh, in, in partnership with the courts um, to prioritize courtrooms and, and, and slowly equip uh, the different courtrooms uh, across the province to better support um, this type of hybrid uh, hearing. That's VHH. Uh, next one is uh, JSO, so Justice Services Online. So I think many of you are aware, so JSO is our e-filing platform. Uh, and this allows users to electronically submit uh, court documents um, to any new or existing civil action or application in the SCJ, and then uh, for family proceedings in both the SCJ and the OCJ. So over the past year, uh, year and a half or so, we've shifted from the, I think maybe more of the traditional kind of development cycle uh, to a more agile approach. And essentially what that means is instead of doing bigger releases, um, you know, a couple times a year, we, we look at doing smaller uh, versions with a goal to release iterations more quickly uh, to the public. So our goal right now is, is usually around eight weeks. We often don't hit that, but uh, it's still a goal and we try. Um, but, but really, we, we, the, the purpose is to really keep the updates coming um, uh, frequently. So over the past year, uh, there's been lots that's happened to JSO. So uh, we introduced, uh, so there's like 70 new uh, types of small claim documents that can now be filed uh, with JSO. Uh, we introduced some enhancements for pre-authorization payments um, within the court documents. So that the goal there really is to help kind of reduce some of the issues we had seen related to refunds. Um, we did some back office in the summer, some back office uh, uh, enhancements to allow data to flow from the platform into some of our case management uh, solutions just to make the processing time hopefully a little bit quicker. Um, and then as we, just as of Monday, so just this week, uh, the last iteration went out. Um, and this one, 
I think will be a well-received feature. It was directly informed from uh, user feedback. Uh, and this includes a, a memo to court staff. So you can add this memo to your submission now, uh, and it allows you to provide a bit more uh, information on the documents um, as, as they're attached. So feedback we heard is that sometimes, you know, it's different than the encounter experience where you can explain to uh, the court staff why something looks a certain way. Um, so now you can use that memo feature to do the same thing, and hopefully it should reduce the number of uh, rejections when filing online. Uh, and the last piece I, I just say, like, as you're filing and your teams are filing, definitely use that, uh, that feedback button. We look at the, the feedback that's there and we try to incorporate it into our backlog so we can squeeze it into one of the future um, iterations. Uh, and case lines. So this one I'll go quickly because I think many of you are familiar with case lines. Um, I think last time uh, we were here, so about a year ago, we were still early on in the deployment of case lines uh, across uh, the province. So just as a recap, case lines is a cloud-based uh, uh, document sharing platform, and it supports uh, to and it really is to support uh, court proceedings. Uh, originally, we when we so last year around this time when we had launched it, it was for a pilot, and we just did it for civil matters and pre-trial conferences. Uh, over the past year, we've gradually introduced the platform to to more regions and more matters matters across the SCJ. Uh, there's details on the slide if you're if you're interested in kind of what that role looked like. Um, but where we are now is that the the applications now uh, been rolled out. Uh, across all SCJ regions. So, so that's, uh, that's good news uh, for, for us and I think those who are using it. Um, and the piece I'd also note is that, you know, we continue to work with the vendor. I know there's tweaks and adjustments that need to be made uh, to the application to make it a little bit more user-friendly. So we continue to work with the vendor uh, and looking for opportunities to, um, to tweak and better improve that solution. And we also are, are right now, we're working in partnership with the OCJ uh, to expand access. So we're not done yet. We're looking uh, and working with the OCJ uh, on that piece. So uh, I'd say in the coming weeks, like stay tuned, Hopefully there'll be some more information on that. Um, so you can keep your eye out there. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, Quartz Digital Transformation. So this one, uh, I'm not sure if you haven't seen the announcement. Uh, you know, afterwards, definitely uh, take a look at the deck and click that link. Um, but just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the, the, the government announced uh, this new initiative. So the, this is another initiative that sits under the Justice Accelerated Strategy. And this is really the, the initiative that will help uh, really transform uh, how you know, and what we're calling is an end-to-end -end digital justice solution. Um, so the goal is really to re replace, so lots of outdated paper-based processes, old legacy software, and then some of the new things we've done, like making things kind of work better together. Um, and what we want to do is provide modern tools uh, and a more consistent and common user experience. So this is obviously a huge transformation, a big project. Um, and and uh, we're working in, in close partnership with both, both the SCJ and the OCJ and closely with Chris as well. And he'll talk a bit about that um, when he's up. Um, but some of the benefits that I'd say you know, we'd hope to see um, are so like one better access to court information. We want to look at more self-serve options. We want to make it easier uh, to, to file documents of some of the things that challenges with JSO looking at how to improve some of those pieces, things like electronic court record, end-to-end -end case management, um, improve access and you know, receive uh, decisions, all, all kind of electronically. So it's quite a long list. It's an ambitious project. Uh, and obviously it's gonna take us a number of years uh, uh, to fully implement. Um, so right now where we are on that is like, we're just right in the procurement process. So can't get into a ton of details on that, but uh, we are actively working on that. So the, the piece I'd add just before I pass over Chris is that as we go further down this path, we're, we're definitely interested and keen to take a, a user-centered approach as we implement this new solution. So, so as we get further along, we'll, we'll, we'll be interested in, in how we can work with you and, and others in the, in the 
the, the province to help inform how the implementation of that, that transformation looks like, because it will impact, you know, kind of many of the things that you, you work on uh, today. So we're, we're looking at looking forward to uh, having the opportunity to work with you uh, on, on helping us uh, um, move, move that initiative forward. So, so that's it for me. So I'll pass it over um, to Chris. Let me just jump to the next slide. Yeah, perfect. Thanks very much. And you can go right on to the next one, Peter. Thanks very much. So the, uh, the criminal justice digital design, uh, as I mentioned, I'm focused exclusively on criminal justice now. So um, the, the CJDD or criminal justice digital design, uh, if you've been around justice long enough, is going to sound a lot like the old integrated justice projects. Uh, it has all the same outcomes and an entirely different way of getting there. Um, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that justice, criminal justice in particular, moves forward in Ontario when a piece of paper moves to the next desk or to the next person in the chain. Um, that's the problem that I'm solving for. So my elevator pitch for this is if I get this right, uh, provided somebody somewhere in the criminal justice ecosystem, and that's both ministry and non-ministry players, has the information or the data, then anybody who's entitled to it should have it through smart system connections. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to do here. So across the top, you'll see the six core groups that we're focused on right now. Uh, our, our journey starts at the police and of course moves into the, the prosecution or the crowns onto defense or self reps, including duty counsel, uh, into courts and court services, over to corrections, and then in some cases off to community services as well. There are more players in the criminal justice sector than just these six, but uh, as a part of getting funding for this and figuring out what we were gonna do with the first four years, we had to draw a box around it somewhere. So uh, while well, the CJDD itself is a seven to 10 year roadmap to break down these silos and get everybody digitally connected, in the first four years, we're focused on these six groups and then we'll start uh, spider webbing out from there. So uh, what we're actually trying to do is create this kind of modernized justice system without replacing everybody's technology. They can still use what they know and love, but by getting those technologies to talk to each other and to share digital data, digital documents, and multimedia files. Uh, so that's, that's really what the goal of this thing is. Uh, and if we can do that, we take so much administrative burden out of the system and so much wasted time in transporting, traveling, keying things in, uh, that we should see things moving more smoothly and more efficiently through the criminal justice system. So we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, when we tried to stitch all of this together, uh, make all this sing and get all these technologies talking, what we found were four big gaps or four big holes in the ship that we needed to plug. And those are the four key products that we started working on. So uh, one of them is called e-intake, uh, and that's really the digital pathway between the police and other enforcement agencies and the court. How do they get their data and their documents and multimedia over to us? Uh, the second was digital evidence management. So you may have seen an announcement, I think it was back in January, uh, and you may have seen some smaller local announcements, but the province went out and actually procured uh, on behalf of municipal police services and other enforcement agencies in the province, a single digital evidence management solution that they're welcome to opt into. They're not forced to use it. But our hope is that because we procured this on behalf of the province, not only do we get great rates, but the more people who adopt it, the more consistency we have in the types of files we're using, how we name and classify them and how they're shared. Uh, so for us, our skin in the game is the consistency throughout the province. For those enforcement agencies, because we're kind of buying en masse and, and looking to bring all of these enforcement agencies to the table, uh, the vendor was able to give us really, really good rates over what any one of us would have got if we had gone it alone. Uh, the third leg on our stool is what we call the digital disclosure and hearing hub. So if you practice criminal law today, you are probably using something called the CDD or criminal digital disclosure hub. Um, that is an early version of what we're talking about here. That was the let's get something out there to get us over the COVID hump. Uh, but really what it does is talks to policing systems and crown systems to aggregate sort of all that information that you need for disclosure so that we can disclose out to defense, duty counsel, self reps, whoever it may be, and it'll evolve over time to start gathering up some other details and making uh, defenses life easier. Uh, and then the last piece was the court's criminal case management solution. Um, so if you've ever talked to somebody from court services or uh, seen behind the counter in a courthouse, you've seen an icon. Uh, it is the old gross black and green screen mainframe system. It is turning, we've got three months to go, but in February it turns 32 years old. It is old. It can officially drive, drink, and serve in the military in every country in the world. 
Um, it is rock solid. It does the trick. There's nothing wrong with it, except that the programming language is so old that it's difficult for us to integrate to that and difficult for us to find programmers for it. So the time has come. So these were the four missions that we had set out on at the outset of this. And all of this would be connected by that enhanced integration platform that you see there. So this is, a, I call it Google Translate for technology. It doesn't care what tech somebody is using. It can take your technology and make it speak the language that ours does so that all of that data and documentation can flow seamlessly. So we'll move on to the next slide. Um, this is, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, don't panic, but uh, for the nerds in the crowd, and I say that lovingly, uh, this is what it looks like when we stitch it all together. So across the top of the slide, you'll see the five or six major phases of a criminal case. And what we've tried to do is lay out all of the systems that are going to need to be connected throughout those uh, throughout that life cycle and how those connections would work. So if you ever have any questions about this one, feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email. I'm always happy to chat about what we're doing, but this is just to kind of give you the lay of the land with what we're doing from a criminal justice perspective. Um, we can move on to the next one. Um, while we had started working on all of this stuff and gotten some early gains on it, COVID happened. So uh, in the meantime, we, we stood up these two interim technologies. So uh, defense lawyers, you're already familiar with the criminal digital disclosure tool. Um, and again, we're going to be evolving that out shortly. I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, one of the other things that you may be noticing uh, is that the look and feel of the information, uh, the charge document, has changed a little bit. You're starting to see digital signatures or things on the page in different places than they were previously. Uh, and that is through the introduction of the eHub and ultimately our e-intake tool. Um, this is uh, the eHub is the interim digital gateway that let police and other uh, non-police enforcement agencies get stuff to us. But that's really all it does. It gets stuff to us digitally in the courts uh, digitally. There's no other information exchange and it doesn't take all that data and reuse it. So uh, it was kind of a baby step on the journey, much like the criminal digital disclosure hub was. So in the next slide is the what's coming. There we go. So e-intake, um, this is the tool that we're building out for the police that will allow them right now. It allows them to send charge packages including the data and the documentation uh, over to a justice of the peace for uh, review and uh, if appropriate issuing process. But then it also takes all that data and automatically plugs it into ICON. So court services don't have to re-enter that and starts a digital case file. So it automatically creates a digital version of that document that people can start working with digitally. Uh, it's out there in about half of the province's enforcement agencies. And by June, we'll be done rolling it out throughout the province. At the same time, we're expanding it. So things like warrants, reports to justice, subpoenas, peace bonds, all the other paperwork that comes from police and uh, non-police enforcement agencies like uh, border services or rail police, all of that will flow digitally from their systems to our systems without the need to print it off, without the need to drive over to a courthouse and sit in intake court. It'll all be, it'll be like digital intake court. Um, the digital evidence management tool is rolling out to police services as we speak. So we've got uh, six on board now, six of the municipal police services. Uh, we've got the OPP on board and between now and March, we'll be expanding to another almost 30 police services, uh, which is fantastic in terms of the consistency and the way that we handle, deal with, classify, store and manage digital evidence in Ontario. Um, it's going to take us probably another two, three years to get that out to all the police services that are interested. And again, not everybody has to use it. It's up to them to opt in. It is not free. Uh, it is super discounted over what they would have paid on their own, but it's not free. Uh, so not everybody will take advantage of that. Uh, and then the last piece is the digital disclosure piece. So for my uh, defense and duty council friends in the crowd, uh, in January, uh, if everything goes according to plan, you will see a change. Uh, the CDD, the Criminal Digital Disclosure Tool that you're using today, will disappear, and the D2, or Digital Disclosure Hub, uh, will step in to take its place. Uh, and we'll talk about what that looks like and what it means for you in just a second. Um, we're also developing the first iteration of the Hearing Hub. So the Hearing Hub is really, um, if digital disclosure is getting ready for court, all of the disclosure and the back and forth that happens there, the hearing hub is really, can I use that stuff in court now and interact with it as a function of my events? Uh, and then the last piece. So we talked about the need to replace ICON. That, of course, is MAG's Court's Digital Transformation Initiative, the one that was recently announced. Uh, so they're looking to replace the case management and case tracking systems that exist in the OCJ and SCJ. 
um, we will hook into that. We need those information exchanges so that whatever's happening around the court can flow seamlessly into the court and whatever the outcomes are that are coming out of those court events can make their way back to defense counsel, to the crown, over to corrections if they need it or onto probation and parole. So we'll be working with them as they implement that initiative in the coming years to make sure that we're hooked in and that those information exchanges still work. Uh, and we'll go on to my last slide, which is really about the digital disclosure piece. So uh, I mentioned it was coming uh, in January. If all goes according to plan, it's mid-January. Uh, the Defence Council will start to see that. Um, this will change the experience. So your today experience is you can log into this thing. You can see a list of files and you can download those files and do whatever you need to do with them on your computer. The tomorrow experience will give you a new interface. It's completely streamlined. It organizes the cases that you're involved in more logically and more intuitively. We took a lot of user feedback based on what we heard out of the CDD experience and used it to improve with this thing. It also gives you a media player inside the tool. So you don't have to download it anymore. You can just watch the video inside the tool or you can look at the documents inside the tool uh, or you can download it if you wanna work with it. Um, it supports a much wider range of file types uh, and it will automatically connect to the crown system scope so that any information that's changing about a case like dates and times, stuff like that will automatically update so that you can see it. Uh, and any evidence that they're receiving from police will automatically land with them so that they can work with it and then disclose it onto you. Um, so we will have some training uh, for that. It's going to be a dead simple to use tool. This is uh, much like your first experience with Dropbox or another file sharing service, but it's tailored uh, to match the, the workflows that we think most defense uh, users use based on all the feedback that we heard when we put out that interim version. Um, yeah. I, I think, I, you know what, I'll stop there. There's not much more to say about that. I don't wanna spoil everything. There'll be some pleasant surprises when it lands in January. Uh, so I think that's it for me as well. And uh, Peter and I would invite you guys to ask questions at this point. Well, Chris, I certainly am looking forward to it. I, I, I am constantly struggling with the current iteration with the uh, <laughs> way that uh, every file that I am sent by a Crown attorney is mixed together in a seemingly random pattern rather than uh, sorted by files. So that uh, that's definitely good. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, I received the question in the chat for uh, Peter, if Peter or Chris, but is there an intent to remove the 10 megabyte size restriction on electronic filings? For for JSO, so it's something we're looking at. There was uh, it was I think the two two questions we received was one was file size and file type. So those are two that we're working with our 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 partners in the, the IT cluster to see if there's something we can do uh, on that one. So I don't have a firm answer, but we're looking at it. Quick question, guys. Um, Corey Wall, I'm the Central East representative. Uh, I'm just curious. What what are this as far as the stakeholders or the end users since we're using tech language <laughs> um, uh, in in the the courts digital transformation initiative uh, who as far as the stakeholders providing feedback and that you're working with from the end user point of view are those just different uh, different individuals that are that are in house or do you have other players that are part of the the process. So what I'd say, so right now, and you know, over the, uh, I would say probably the past year, we we have worked with like a couple of consulting firms and done some some user research. So directly with lawyers and self reps and uh, and you know within the ministry and within the courts, because we're in this procurement process right now, it's a bit we're a bit careful. Um, but the plan would be to like figure out what are some opportunities for us to engage. Uh, directly with uh, you know those who who will directly be impacted by this. So uh, we will be like you know. So if you're interested and you want to put your hand up and provide feedback, then then that's definitely something where we're we're putting my name forward right now. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. I'm writing your name down. So, but we'll, as we get further along, we'll do something so we can can we communicate this more broadly to make sure we have good representation and lots of people involved. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And the, uh, the same will apply from the criminal justice side. I realize the only outward facing tool that we've got on the to-do list right now is that digital disclosure hub, but uh, we know the, the original version of it was a bit of an awkward experience. So if there are any criminal lawyers out there who want to get involved in the testing for each of the iterations that we're going to be releasing of that tool, uh, then by all means, just shoot me an email.